welcome to Married to Movies. Industry insiders John Russell and Tracy Kring live and work happily in cinema matrimony. They're sharing behind the scenes adventures of writing, producing, and appreciating films. Babe. Good morning, babe. How you doing? We're up earlier than usual. It was kind of a uh, it was kind of a rough night. It was like cold, and I think our blankets got uh, unplugged. Oh no! And I think maybe I was like taking your covers. You were. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I woke up several times saying, "Stop taking my covers." You're not doing it. You don't know you're doing it. I don't believe in that. <laughs> Wait, you don't believe in that. If you don't have consideration for other people, when you're out of it. When you're unconscious. How? You're unconscious. That means you don't have consideration, period. Oh, my gosh. Really? Every time I roll over, I fluff the cover so that I'm liberated from the cover and I can roll. Mm -hmm. I do not move the cover. You take it with you. I consider that inconsiderate. And that's wow. the thing you can, you can just train yourself to do. Start the day with shame. <laughs> You brought it up, dude. <laughs> sure, I did. We had our um, big industry meeting mm -hmm. at the talent agency, and I had uh, probably half a dozen of uh, my students mm -hmm. who I've been uh, coaching come in and uh, do their monologues for mm -hmm. the uh, casting agents. Some of them did a little bit better than others. I felt like it had so much to do with just their anxiety. In those Not just my people. I mean, every you know, a oh, lot sure. of the people, probably 75% of the people were surprisingly nervous. Anytime you're coming in to talk to anyone, mm -hmm. I think you're going to be nervous. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, you get nervous, you can't even help it. Part of the problems of nerves are that we are looking for moments in our lives. Mm -hmm. We are giving importance and value to, like, certain things, and we are guessing what those things will be. And don't you kind of find that you very rarely recognize your moments as they're happening? <laughs> yeah. You know, the ones you thought were the big moments were a lot of the time. They just, just kind of went by. Yeah, they're the duds. They're kind of the, oh, all right, that happened. You know, they're, I'm not saying they're disappointments. I'm just saying that you kind of interpreted them in a way that kind of ruined it. In, in terms of like living in that space. Oh, like living in the moment. Living in that moment. If there, if it is actually a big moment, you just kind of go out of body. Like you're not really even connected to your body because you're so in the moment. When you get married, mm -hmm. when we got married, we hire photographers for this exact reason. We know that's what happens. Right. That we are going to be out of body. We're going to be living in the moment and we will have no recollection of our own wedding. Mm -hmm. True. Without the photo of it, I, I I wouldn't be able to tell you how everyone was standing. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to right. tell you where we were on the beach. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to tell you many details other right. than like a feeling. Things that seemed so innocuous, like, you know, for example, you know, when we, you know, met our producer and... But we met him through the fact that we had uh, posted something on a charity website. And that was not a big moment. No, it's not a big moment. There was nothing about that moment that would tell, okay, we're going to post on this charity website. And this is our moment. Yeah, this is it. You know, it, no. it wasn't that way at all. But I walk in and I'm talking to the uh, vice president of Sony and I'm like, oh, this is a big moment. And nothing happens out of that. <laughs> Maybe that's like a blessing that that big moments are actually disguised. Mm-hmm. Because it keeps you from being nervous. Mm-hmm. And it's the ones that we add big moment vibes to. Right. That make us nervous. I tell you what, though, in an audition, I would not know you were nervous if you didn't rush. If you rush, I know you're nervous. Right. And if you just like went slow. Mm-hmm. Acted cool? Mm hmm I'd never know. It is true. It's like people are subconsciously trying to get it over as quickly as possible. Mm hmm We finished True Detective. No mm. spoilers. Nailed the landing. Just... There was a lot to tie up. Oh, my God. Well, remember, at the beginning of it, I was like, how in the hell are they going to answer all of these questions mm -hmm. that they have proffered mm -hmm. throughout five episodes? This has gone too fast. This has to have gone too fast. 
It was extremely well written. It reminded me of one of my favorite uh, Sherlock Holmes, which is um, Hound of the Baskervilles. Because Hound of the Baskervilles always had this vibe like, okay, this is like all supernatural, like crazy supernatural things are happening. And then they came up with a a logical, modern explanation of what you thought was the supernatural. Or is that (laughs) Scooby-Doo? Yes. Yes, that is Scooby-Doo. But I think that that doesn't lessen the quality of it, though, babe. You meddling Jodie Foster. Nobody said that, okay? <laughs> we we did notice some some of Jodie's film reference, though, like from Silence of the Lambs. I, did, I don't know if that's a reference. It's just that when you see Jodie Foster walking around with a gun in the dark, you totally go to her down with, you know, uh, well. Buffalo... Bill? B- Buffalo Bill. Or is it yeah. Buff- yeah, Buffalo Bill. I always get confused with Buffalo Bill and Buffalo Bob. True Detective. I think they nailed it. I thought it was great. It's not the first season. No, um, the first season of True crazier. Detective is really a masterpiece. Oh, no. it's it's. I think it's the greatest one season of television in history. That's my opinion. Oh, well, I don't, I don't know about that. But a show that we started went somewhere I did not expect it to go was The New Look. And mm-hmm. the guy from that is from The Insider. Mm-hmm. Yes. He He's pla- playing Christian Dior. Christian Dior. And there is a whole story there between Christian Dior and Chanel that, I mean, maybe people in the fashion world know, but uh, I'm just like, holy cow. Yeah. That I'm is like, some amazing shit the right hell? there. Other things have opened this way, but this did it in such an organic way. It did. It did. Um, He's a very nervous man. He's having his tarot read. He does not want to go on stage at this talk at this famous college. Uh, They're doing a retrospective of all of his greatest looks. Right. And they have all the women walk out, and it is beautiful, and it is like everything that you remember about the 50s. You know, it's beautiful. He gets asked the question during the... Nazi occupation of France. Right. Coco Chanel went into hiding. Mm-hmm. She reclused herself. Right. And she closed and, her her shop. Right. Right. And so, and but because that's the other thing that's happening is right now Chanel is coming back and is talking some smack to him and yeah. saying Chanel is here to save. Uh, Haute de Couture because Dior has destroyed it. This four years of occupation. She has been a recluse and and been obviously in support of France. And he has been working this whole time, making dresses for Nazi women to wear. Right. He's like, well, it's not quite what it seems. And it is not. And it's not. No. And he was also working for another fashion house. Mm-hmm. So. John Malkovich <clears throat> delivering as usual. First of all, he doesn't he sound. He can't Eng- do an accent. He does, well, yeah, but he doesn't sound English either. He doesn't no, sound like that an man American. Cannot do an accent. He is John Malkovich. He's Malkovich. It's his thing. Malkovich, Malkovich, Malkovich. No, like, <laughs> and and I think he could literally. He's he's got an accent that's like more transatlantic. Yes, but it's like his own accent. Right. It's just the way he came out of the womb. Or I something. feel like when he, you look at him in like something like Dangerous Liaisons. And that feels so authentically him. Yeah. You know, that accent, that vibe. He's just got a very affected way of speaking. Yeah, absolutely. There was also another movie of his that I absolutely love. Uh, and it was basically about him and and his uh, girlfriend. And they lived in hotels and basically were always trying to, like, fake their way through life and always... I remember Yeah, that. it was what a was real... It I don't remember the name of that movie. I like that it movie It was a really lot. good movie because, yeah, exactly. He was just like a, he was just like a ne'er-do-well kind of a con man. Yeah. Always but just like just going like... from hotel suite to hotel suite and never paying. I would say that uh, the new look is a, you know, definitely our new, uh, our new thing. Yeah. Our new, I wouldn't say our new obsession. And I think what's really interesting about a show like that is it's asking questions about when you are forced by evil to do evil things, 
Right. How much responsibility do you actually have? Yes. Chanel was basically like... Greed. I want my <laughs> shit. Uh, the Nazis can help me get it. She actually yeah. wanted to use Aryan law yeah. to help her. Yeah, yeah, And she yeah. got way too deep in That's it. That's way, way effed up. Oh, man, that one Nazi guy was such a creep. That one dude... Is it Object of Beauty? No. Oh, it might be Object of Beauty. Okay, question. That's possible. Because guess who's in Object of Beauty? Who? Andy McDowell. That's it. That's the one. That's the one. That's the one. It's him and Andy McDowell. That's the one. Yes. That is it. Object of Beauty. And they're both just cons. Con total cons and creeps. That's such a good movie. It and is. you know what? Andy, like, she's actually really, she's really connected with something in her age now. Yeah. But remember her in, uh, Tarzan of Greystoke. Oh. And they dubbed her over. Oh, yeah. That's not good. That really sucked for her. Oh, speaking of dubbing, I have heard something about Madam Web. Oh, yeah. That the about ADR all the bad guy? is horrible. Yeah. I mean, first of all, the fact that just everyday people are talking about ADR. It's right. just telling well, you. I, I say this all the time. You see, a, you see bad ADR all the time. I say this all the time that audiences are too sophisticated now. Like, mm. you cannot do that you crap. Can't, you can't pull the shit You're on them. You're not getting no. away with anything. But the fact that they would, people like just Joe Blow on the street, it's like, man, that ADR is just shit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they know. It's like, what? What are you talking about, dude? They absolutely know. Oh, my. I mean, it. How do things like that happen? Maybe I don't know. It's like when they're making it, they don't know it's a piece of crap. But once you know who start... knew it was a piece of crap was Dakota Johnson. Oh god, because she she's just like she's just shitting she looks all miserable. over it as she's like promoting that, it. That press tour <laughs> girl should have had some like champagne beforehand because she <laughs> looks miserable. And like they ask her questions and she's like. Well, it's really nice, like, not to have to be in the Marvel Universe and know anything about it. Yeah, exactly. And just lying about things that she knows that she knows she doesn't know. And, like, it's people so are asking funny. about... <clears throat> so in the original... Mat no, it was so funny. There was this one where this guy, like, shows up with, like, the original comic. I saw it on uh, Instagram. And she acts like she gives a shit. Oh, wow. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> just did not care. <laughs> Made no well, difference to her at all. The trailer, I when I saw the trailer and I really like Wonder Woman and all that, I really want to support the female superheroes. But when the filmmakers, when the studios give so little shits yeah. about making it any good. Yeah. It, it's like, it, it makes me even more mad. I really do think that there is a pattern there. Because look at the Marvels, the same kind of a vibe where it felt like effort was not given. You know? It, 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 that, it, that first Wonder Woman, DC. Oh, man. That was great. And that, I cried in the theater because it was like so nice to see it was, it a was. female superhero. No, Gail Gadot, man. No, Gail Gadot killing it. That was a, no, it was a great story. I think it's a. Tr I think it's that one's a tremendous movie. Uh, the second Wonder Woman. Oh, the eighties one. Ooh, yeah. Ooh, the turning into the cheetah thing. Oh my god. Yeah, the the second one was the eighties one was was kind of weird, and it was like eighties in the way that like a Barbie movie yeah, set would be eighties. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It wasn't like authentic. Didn't feel authentic. Like Stranger Things does the eighties way better. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Masters of Air is the new Game of Thrones. They are just killing characters. Okay. I, <laughs> just wiping them out, man. Uh, okay. <laughs> if, if you watched the last episode and I was complaining about there being no women, mm. then the very next episode, there was like women everywhere. So you're wrong is what you're saying. Well, let's see if we continue to see them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> also, they were just like... Patching people up and delivering sandwiches. Yes, yeah, so, they were. They were. They were making sandwiches. I'm, I'm not <laughs> kidding. It is a literal reference to what they were doing. That's right. There was a moment 
when the guy comes up to her in, in Masters of No, oh, no, in, in Masters of Air. In Masters of Air. And he reminded me so much of the character in Hot Shots who was called Dead Meat. Oh. <laughs> oh, gotcha, gotcha. Wait, isn't Hot Shots like a spoof? Comedy? Yes, it is. So, Masters of Hot Air Shots is the of spoof, spoof of Top Gun. Right, right. So, okay. with that <laughs> with that guy, okay, I'll be back. Hey, when we get back, I I hope that you and I, maybe we could have babies together. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was exactly like that, bye. Yeah. 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 How, are, how they are incorporating women. How they are incorporating people of color. How they are... In, I cannot tell. Is this well written? Right. Or is this... One of the worst written things I've ever seen. <laughs> there have been two characters now who like... Now, the first character, we were... The the guy who plays Elvis, Bear? right? The, oh, yeah. The, Austin oh, Butler. The, Austin Butler. Yeah, Austin Butler. We're following him this whole time. Right. For several episodes. Right. And then... He just... He gets shot down. We don't see him get shot down. We don't see him shot down. And we, we don't see a damn thing. Right. We're, we're like okay. two episodes we're, past that. His and, friend is like fucking this girl and then he gets a call... And he's like, yeah, he's dead. Right. And now... His friend doesn't seem really broken up about it either. He's just like, oh, let me go kill some Nazis. Yeah. <laughs> um, is this a device they're using to make us feel like the guys back then would have felt? Right. Like, my friend, I knew he was going on a mission. He flew off. He never came back. It's like he disappeared off the face of the planet. I think that makes sense. I feel like... Or is it just bad writing? I feel... No, well, I mean, they're doing it on purpose. Why do I not know the difference? Well, they're is obviously... It my fault? They're, no, it's not your fault. They're obviously doing it on purpose. It is weird, you know, because I really feel his absence. Because it's really hard to tell who the hell is who on the show. They're always All wearing... These, they always have the masks look, on, you know, in the plane. Every and single one of them Who is are white. these people? They're all the exact same white color. They all have brown hair. I can't tell them apart. They yeah. all have like little mustaches or something. Austin Butler, I could actually pick him out of a crowd of these white men. And uh, <laughs> he's gone. And it's like they're... T and, and every single dude, they... they oh, now we're going to follow this guy's story. And now we're going to follow this guy's story. And I understand they're dropping like flies. Right. Which but, is kind of the point. Yeah. Yeah. Like we couldn't possibly follow yeah, it's like yeah, it's, it's like 170 uh, people go out and like, five come back. Five come yeah, back. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know they're going to die and it's not realistic to think we're going to follow one character all the way to the end. Right. They're going to die. Could they have like just drawn numbers on them or something <laughs> yes. for me? Yes. Yes, ab absolutely. That would be a little bit like Nazis, though. No, they're like you want to put all a little number right here for the Masters of Air. They all wear the same thing. <laughs> yeah. A little star, okay? Yeah. Put a yeah. Star on. <laughs> exactly. They all wear the same damn thing. They all uh, yes. have the same facial hair. Yes. I can't figure out who's who. Yes, there is a universality to it, but I think that's kind of the point is that war turns you into a number you, yes uh, a statistic a, exactly a male face yes yeah a mustache war <laughs> turns you into a mustache when whenever a plane goes down you're supposed to make a, a log entry right it's like okay that plane went down what okay. time it happened were there parachutes how right. many parachutes all this type of thing but when you're like in the Getting shit shot at, yeah <laughs> They're like, uh, this plane. And they're like, we no, don't know. No entry. We don't know. We no don't entry. Know. <laughs> no we entry. don't know. I completely failed this test, sir. I don't know if it's good, but I enjoy it. You think about uh, the other shows, uh, the Pacific and especially Band of Brothers. Yeah. You knew those were good. Oh, uh, we watched uh, Anatomy of a Fall. Oh, my God. So great. Sandra Hewler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But she's also in um, the Zone of Interest. Zone of Interest, which we have so not she's seen. She's had a still. very big year. Oh my God. She's Enormous year. year. I think that script incredible. is perfect. It is such an incredible script. Like, kudos. Her perform. I mean, she owns that movie. I mean, she that movie is, movie is her. And the kid is great, too. The kid was awesome. Unbelievable. It really pisses me off he's not up for supporting actor. He should be. He it should really be. pisses me off. I mean, he. I'm, I'm sorry. That kid is putting like Robert Downey Jr. No, to shame it's like a, in it's, that movie. It's an Anna Paquin. Oh, it is. Role it from is. the piano. Absolutely. Yeah. It's like that. Right. 
and it's really unfair. And and we really you're taking something that is so like pr- procedural. It's so law and order. Okay, and this story. The the French judicial system. <laughs> oh like, my God! It's so fucked. I don't know how. <laughs> How many, do they get anything done? How many people are in their prisons <laughs> who are completely innocent and just really bad speakers? Yeah, you have to be a really uh, great orator to get through no, a French you have trial. To be smart. <laughs> they can just question anybody they want to at any time. Just like boom, boom. Just like uh, and hearsay and opinion. Hearsay and opinion admissible all the time. Admissible. It was nothing but hearsay and opinion. I mean, it was just like, the, the, the I guys, think maybe this happened. Okay. And no, thank ne- you. never an shit. objection. No one ever objected to anything. You're sitting there on trial Ooh. and they can just have a, have a witness come up and then you can actually like be involved in the witness interrogation too. It was so weird. Yeah. Even right. Even the accused can ask a question Of the witness against them. The man who died, his psychiatrist gets up there. Right. And the psychiatrist is saying just opinions on what his mental state was. Right. And she's coming back with, well, that's one side of it. Right. And that stuff is true, but that's not the whole scope of the life. The fight that they have. Yeah, they have a fight, which he recorded. Oh, he was kind of a, that guy was a fucking coward. Yes. That guy was lackluster artist. That guy did not have much to offer. No, there was, there was a certain kind of a jealousy and a little bit of a misogyny. Anatomy of a Fall is one of those movies that for me is going to be like Margin Call or The Big Short or Spotlight where I really crave to see it again. Really? Yeah. Okay. Because I feel like immediately I felt like I should watch it again and I might pick up on things. Yeah, that's true. You Mysteries. Know? Yeah. I was just like, oh, did I miss this or did I miss that? And I actually have a theory, a third theory, which is none of the things that they said happened happened and something completely else happened. It was an owl that knocked him out the window. It did have a lot of the staircase in it. <laughs> I want to tell a story. Okay. Our microwave broke. <laughs> It just stopped working, you know, as microwaves do. They just stop. They do. And um, you were supposed to take it out to the trash. I was. You enjoy, when it's a larger, bulky item, instead of carrying it out to the car and driving it down to the dumpster, you enjoy throwing it off the front porch. Like some prehistoric creature. I mean, like, it's, I've seen a chair. (laughs) Yeah. I've seen a chair go over the front porch. I've seen... (laughs) So many things, bulky items. You Am just I the only it. one, man? Am I the only one who feels a this? rug? You threw a rug yeah. over the porch. You just like it. You pick up the microwave and, I do. and you're like, ooh, I get to throw this off the front porch. Right, right, exactly. Okay, so it's actually just snowed a little, right? Like a half an inch. Right. And you go out on the front porch and you are chucking it over. Well, okay. No. So let me just add here a, okay. li- a little detail. Mm hmm. The microwave is a bit heavy to chuck over the front porch. And also, I knew that it was just going to explode if I threw it that way. If okay. I if I ooga booga it. Right. Okay. So, I took the microwave and I took the cord. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I was going to kind of like like lower let it throw. out. Yeah, right. yeah, lower it slowly. Right. And uh, it got to a critical mass, <laughs> kind of like a, some sort of pulley physics. Yes, yes. Where it had become top heavy in, yes. in force. Right, or bottom heavy in this case. And the force of it yes. fall yes. pulled you right over. Right over. Yes. Right over the railing. I, I, <laughs> I did not do the physics correctly. All I see is like feet going over the rail. <laughs> And the first thing that I say out loud is, I'm a widow. (laughs) I'm dead now. No, I'm I'm a widow. You're a widow and I'm dead. Yes. I'm a widow. I'm trying to peel all this stuff off of me so I can get off uh, off my ass and go check on you Mm -hmm. to observe the corpse. And uh, 
I'm screaming your name <laughs> and you say, I'm okay. I'm okay. It could have looked like I killed you. It really did. You made an impression in the snow that looks like a body. Yes. Your body. What would that? They would have thought I would be like nine one one. My husband fell off the porch. Right. Yeah. Right, lady. Right. They would have gotten here and been like, right. What's? I would have been a suspect immediately. Like you hit me in the back of the head. I fell no. off the porch. Then you dropped the microwave down there. No, to I think, fake it. I think the microwave would have been. They thought they would think an afterthought. Right. That I had pushed you over the railing. Right. You had died, and then I threw the microwave down and made up this whole microwave story. At anatomy of a fall, too, right there. And and while I was watching that movie, I turned to you and said, <laughs> anatomy of a fall, this would have been my life. This would have been my life. Hey, let's let the folks hear some Origian. Origian! Part- you did not die, which is... Yeah, th- thank you. Thank you for that. Exterior, ride home day. Three vehicles pull up to the ride's home. Security jumps into action from the black van. The door of Ian's automobile opens on its own and he steps out. He walks up to his head of security. Wasn't that a nice ride? Security. Lovely, sir. Oh, uh, you don't have many windows in there. We'll make you one with more windows. That's not necessary. No, it's no trouble. Sir, they should be bulletproof. Of course. Exterior, ride porch day. Ian and his publicist, who holds a package, walk up to the door, and before they ring the bell, it opens. Ian, you must be Mrs. Ride? Grace. And you're Ian Solange. Ian. Jeffrey! Jeff. Just call me Jeff. Jeff opens up the door wide for them to come in. Ian. It is such a lovely day, and this is such a nice space. How about we talk out here? Grace and Jeff look at each other for guidance. I know. Anytime I have to move, it's very stressful. Let's just enjoy the day nature has given us. Where is the lady of the hour? Emmeline. Jeff coaxes Emmeline from behind him. She looks away, but not at the ground. Ian motions to his publicist to hand him the box she has. Ian bends down on the porch face to face. Ian bends down face to face with a 10-year-old. Ian, Emmeline, it is an honor to meet you. I have something here for you. Emmeline reluctantly takes it. She opens up the box, which is filled with computer parts, circuit boards, memory cards, and assorted circuitry. The one at the bottom? That's very special. And just for you. It's the Titan 10, the newest in the series of the most sought-after tech we've ever produced. Emmeline looks at it like it's Christmas morning. She sets down the box and runs in the house. Grace calls after her. Emmeline! Ian, it's fine. Let's have a seat. The four of them make their way over to two chairs and a porch swing with a tiny plant table between them. Celia pulls a form out from her bag. Celia, as we discussed on the phone, this is a standard non-disclosure agreement that simply states you won't share the contents of any conversation regarding Origian or Mr. Solange with a third party. Grace and Jeff sign the paper. Celia hands over a check. The retainer. For your time and taking this exploratory meeting. They both look at the check for $10,000. Ian, where's your other daughter? Jeff. Oh, uh, Bettina's staying with a friend. Oh, then please give this to her. Ian hands a small envelope out of his pocket to Jeff. It's a $1,000 gift card to any of Origian's stores. I know when I was young, I wanted my own money to get what I wanted. Jeff, she'll be thrilled. Grace, can I get anyone a drink or a snack? Ian, if that's no trouble. Oh, it's already made. Oh, well, in that case, Celia, would you mind bringing out some snacks for us? Uh, that way we can get started. Celia looks at the surprised couple. Grace. Sure. Uh, there's a charcuterie tray on the kitchen table and a tray of glasses next to it. There's also a pitcher of iced tea in the fridge. Uh, sorry, place is a mess. Ian, thank you so much, Celia. Celia goes inside, and as she walks in, she bumps into Emmeline, who has Robbie and several tools in her arms. Emmeline picks up the gift box and goes outside, sitting down on the ground next to her parents. Ian Solange smiles as he rocks in his swing, watching the young girl start to take her dog apart and incorporate the new elements. Ian, she'll have that dog running the world before this is over. Grace, we offered to get her a real one, but she wasn't interested. Ian, why would she be? It doesn't need a thing except your love. No feeding or cleaning up. It'll never die. It's really the perfect companion. Emmeline briefly looks around at the adults talking about her and then goes back to her surgery. Ian, so I'm here. I know you know what we're trying to do. What can I answer for you? Jeff, Mr. Solange, we appreciate your interest, but Emmeline is a wonderful girl who has issues. Ian, the spectrum. I'm on it too, as a matter of fact. Grace, really? You seem... Oh, please don't say normal. (laughs) I would take that as an insult. 
my struggle to relate to the world around me has made me. I used to feel like I was in a glass box and no one could hear me and I couldn't be heard by them. Grace, that sounds horrible. But that's the thing. It wasn't. In that box, I have total autonomy. I create my own reality. I now can spend my time solely on the activities that only I can do. I have nothing to hide. I have nothing to protect. I have nothing to prove. I have nothing to defend. Now, who do I choose to be? The first step is establishing that something is possible. And then we start working on probability. Celia comes in with the iced tea. Ian, here, I'll pour. Celia, I'll be back with the snacks. Mrs. Ride, it looks like a lovely assortment. Celia goes back inside. Grace, can you grab Emmeline's robot cup? She won't drink without it. It's in the cabinet next to the stove. No problem. Thank you, Celia. Ian, she's amazing. She'd been toiling away programming, and she pointed out to her boss that he'd made a mistake. He argued with her and fired her. So she caused a big stink about it. And when I looked into the situation, I saw how underutilized she was and made her one of the faces of our company. Incidentally, I think her boss is an assistant manager of a battery store now. Drinking tea. Oh, this is so refreshing. Is there a bit of mint? Grace. Yes, there is. Ian takes a deep breath. Ian, are you spiritual? Jeff. We don't really subscribe to any religion. Ian, religion is the worst idea that man ever came up with, and that's saying something. Grace, I definitely believe there is something. Ian, yes, yeah, that's it, something. That's what we need. Without something, we have nothing. No hope, no will, no drive. All that is me can't just blink out of existence. Even if it does, I can't believe that it does. There's something out there. Maybe a dying star whose last flicker is being misinterpreted, but it also could be the savior of mankind. Jeff, you really believe that? Ian, I believe asking humanity to save itself from the mess that it's made is like asking a polar bear to stop climate change. It doesn't have the capacity or the knowledge or the technology to stop the ice from melting. You know what I'm talking about? Sia comes in with a tray of cold cuts and vegetables. She sets down the tiny robot glass. Ian pours some iced tea into it and bends down to Emmeline, giving it to her. Ian, I see what you're doing there. Very outside the box. Making eye contact, she almost smiles at him. Ian, you're welcome. He stands up. You are living in a floodplain. It didn't flood here for 100 years and then 50, and now it floods every year. How many times have you had to replace all your treasures? Two or more, right? Now you have to leave this lovely place, a house that you should have been able to leave to your grandchildren if they wanted it. A refugee in your own country. Jeff, we'll be fine. Ian, maybe. But what about those without your privilege? You can't afford to put your house up on stilts, but they can't afford to even move. As this hellish world transforms, they will be burned alive. Grace, well, that's a pretty bleak view, isn't it? Uh, Things are changing. People are trying. I mean, at least we are. That's wonderful. And that is what I'm trying to do. To reach for something or, or an answer to everything. Did you ever read Watership Down? Grace, traumatized by it, yeah. The rabbits. They have to move because people are destroying their habitat and then they have to kill to survive. But what if the rabbits could talk to the people running the bulldozers? They wouldn't destroy their den. They would move on. No rabbit war. Jeff, in this analogy, are we the rabbits? I have to believe that any advanced species would have to be more advanced in their empathy as well. If we can reach them before we die, they'll help us. Grace, I think you mean before you die. I do mean that. You may not believe this, but I'm not greedy. Yes, yes, I have trillions of dollars, but I'm willing to risk all of it. What's wrong with wanting to be in the history books? Your daughter could do amazing things. She might save lives with her knowledge. She could revolutionize robotics. But if there isn't a world to utilize her gifts, then she's wasted. I know it is a lot. We're firing an arrow into the air. Jeff, what would happen if she wanted to do this? She would go into training immediately. We approximate this will take six years. I think Emmeline will excel. By a gift of DNA, her brain is uniquely prepared for this, but we have to train her body. She has to stay in a controlled environment separate from the rest of the world. Grace, but but we will be able to see her for for birthdays and holidays and, and visits. Ian, of course. But we have to maintain an antiseptic environment. There'll continue to be a separation. Celia, for your sacrifice, for the well-being of the planet, Origian will pay you the sum of $10 million for Emmeline's participation. Ian, I know that doesn't buy what you would be losing. 
but you could unpack those boxes right now. Stay right here. We've developed an industrial use mnemonic system that could be adapted for your home. Jeff, it, it would be up to Emmeline. Uh, we need to talk about it. Ian, but I was planning on taking her right now. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> this is the biggest decision of your lives. The head of security comes on the porch and whispers to Ian. It seems one of your neighbors may have called the press. I, I love that she's taking apart her little pet dog. Right. While they're talking all this, all this stuff about her future. Right. And she's just, I'm sure, listening, but very involved in what she's doing. I just feel like that scene is revealing so much of the mindset of the one percent i was watching actually not very romantic movies i was watching more like people breaking up movies. i don't even understand what that was I don't know. it was just like they every just... movie was like this guy is a horrible person happy valentine's day i found heartburn yes and he is I mean, horrible come on jack nicholson and meryl streep yeah, absolutely like, you got to watch that movie. I th There's so many people in that movie. I, yeah, it has a just a murderer's row Stalker cast. Channing. So many There's people. There's so many people in that movie. Oh, um. Uh, Jeff Daniels. Jeff Daniels. There's yeah. so many good people in that movie. It's an, it's, it's an old-fashioned movie. It's Mike Nichols who did uh, The Graduate. Okay, look, look. I, I, I noticed this. Okay. okay. Uh, the other day, you were actually watching At Close Range. Yes. And the second you turned and it and it, it came on, right. I heard wow, 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 which is the Madonna song. Yes. Right. Right. And I know that that Madonna song basically is the entire score. The I was watching Heartburn. Yes. Coming around again that Carly Simon did is the entire score. Right. It goes da 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 da. Yeah, like all the ba, time and ba, 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 ba. yeah. And it's like it keeps coming up, and quite honestly. At times, I'm like, mm, this isn't the piece of music I would put with it's this It's a scene. little repetitive, and yeah. It's very and, repetitive. Yeah, and it's, yeah, and the the vibe is a little bit weird. Sometimes the vibe is not yeah. the vibe. I and then, thinking, so, so then you were like, what other movies do this? Where they basically take a song. Well, okay, you got At Close Range who does it. Right. Heartburn who does it. Heartburn does it. And we're trying to think about, like, when does this come up again? Well, The Graduate did it. The Graduate, yes. Another but Mike that's Nichols Mike movie. Nichols. Another Mike Nichols film. And then I thought about Carly Simon again. Working Girl. Working Girl. Yeah, Let the River Run, which I think is ridiculous because what that movie is, what that, what the song Let the River Run is about has nothing to do with a working girl in New York City. It's working Girl is a trash it's movie. It's terrible. It's, it's a terrible. trash movie. Uh, Dirty Dancing could kind of qualify there with the time of my life. Yeah. Um, because they do use that theme a few times right. in score. Celine Dion's song from Up Close and Personal, Because You Love Me. Oh, God. I love Up Close and Personal. Oh, wow. Another trash movie. It's trash. <laughs> and like you could kind of say uh, The End by The Doors. Yeah, for Apocalypse Now. Yeah. Yeah, because they use it at, they use it at the beginning and they use it at the end. We're getting into like where they're really featured. Yeah, that's instead of like that's where really they're not the same score. thing. But the doggy is not happy right now. Yeah. The <laughs> dogs are all freaking out. Why, why? I ran out of hot dogs to throw at them. Yeah, we we probably need an entire pack of hot dogs to uh <laughs> That's going to get costly to do this thing if I have to pay for a whole pack of hot dogs. They're a dollar 18 at Walmart. <laughs> All right, now you know uh, how much we pay for hot dogs, folks. Aldi has better hot dogs. This, this is true. Remember that. Aldi has better hot dogs. It's hard not to get romantic about movies. Thanks for listening to Married to Movies. John and Tracy will meet you for breakfast tomorrow.